Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. Um, over the next half hour, I'd like to review with you some of the clinical features and early diagnostic signs of MPS2 or Hunter syndrome. And before we move on to those, uh, I would draw your attention to the series of photographs that you have in front of you uh, of uh, individuals at different ages, all with Hunter syndrome, uh, and the evolution, uh, particularly of the facial features. Um, this is one of many aspects of variability in this syndrome, and uh, in, this is true more than most people realize with genetic conditions in general, but it's particularly true with a metabolic storage disease where there's an active process going on that leads to complications developing uh, after birth as well as before birth. If you look at the two photographs on the left of the younger boys, I don't think most people would pick them out of a crowd based on their facial features. Uh, a, a medical geneticist might look at the second boy and see his bulbous nose and his large head and forehead. Uh, but even then, it wouldn't speak to a specific diagnosis, only to the idea that there were some developmental issues. In contrast, on the three photographs on the right, you see the progressive evolution of a set of quite distinctive facial features, uh, which, again, to people who've seen the syndrome before, people would recognize, recognize immediately as suggesting at the very least, an MPS storage disorder, if not specifically MPS2 itself. So uh, bear in mind as we go through this, this developmental theme, but also considerable variability. So I could show you another set of photographs all matched for ages here where some uh, patients might have more or less distinctive features at the same age in these examples. Moving to the next slide, um, an important Part of our emphasis here is going to be on the intersection of two uh, surgical procedures or, or, or signs that lead to surgical procedures that represent early in life and that overlap here, uh, they, those being adenoidectomy and adenotonsillectomy uh, due to chronic infection and also to deposition of glycosaminic glycans or GAGs or MPS in those uh, structures and then inguinal hernia. Um, these two uh, symptoms, both of which lead to surgical procedures, are really often the earliest signs of this disease. To look at that in more detail, um, it's been well documented in the medical literature that the incidence of Hunter syndrome, which predominantly affects boys, uh, occurs in one in 162,000 live births, rare by anybody's definition. And so if one sees children who've had those two surgical procedures or the diseases that lead up to them, then one should think about the possibility of, a, of MPS2 in particular, but also of other MPS storage diseases in those patients. What is Hunter syndrome? Hunter syndrome is one of eight distinct mucopolysaccharide storage disorders, collectively known as the mucopolysaccharidoses. Um, the term mucopolysaccharide, or MPS, is used interchangeably. Uh, with the preferred modern term of glycosaminoglycan for the material that's stored. And there are eight distinct clinical syndromes and, in fact, several more biochemical disorders that can lead to those syndromes, some of which produce patterns that are indistinguishable from each other. It is, as I've mentioned, a genetic condition. It's X-linked. It follows traditional recessive inheritance. And it uh, almost exclusively affects males, although we do know of some 40 or 50 females around the world who have Hunter syndrome because of complicated genetic rearrangements. All of the signs and symptoms of this condition are caused by a deficiency or absence of the lysosomal enzyme iduronate 2 sulfatase which I'll refer to as I2S going forward. The lysosome, is, as you may recall, is an comp intracellular compartment with an acid pH that contains a lot of enzymes that are responsible for breaking down waste products and recycling waste components of cellular metabolism. And uh, the specific function of I2S is to degrade these glycosaminoglycans, which are specialized glycoproteins, whose normal function uh, often follows that of cartilage uh, and is in the connective tissue. And the deficiency of the enzyme results in a harmful accumulation of the GAGs, where they damage the cells, the tissues, ultimately the organs, and the whole patient through a combination of physical effects of storage, in other words, organ enlargement, and inflammation related to the presence of the gags being there, and complications of that inflammation, often including infection. The most common symptoms that are likely to present to an ear, nose, and throat specialist that may be relevant to this disease 
are indeed just that, common symptoms. The important point is if they're occurring in combination, if they're occurring earlier in life than you'd usually expect, and if they're particularly severe or refractory to treat, you should uh, think about the possibility of this or related conditions as an underlying diagnosis. Uh, starting with the ear, one has recurrent otitis media, which is usually more severe, more frequent, more recurrent, and more refractory to treatment than the typical cases of otitis media one sees in children of that age. And so the boys often end up with tympanostomy tube placements, and they will develop hearing loss. The hearing loss in this condition is, is complicated because later on there's a sensory neural component, but at a young age it will be conductive. They have a set of respiratory symptoms, including recurrent infections, a chronic watery rhinorrhea that is usually not infectious and is difficult to, uh, to deal with, upper airway obstruction due to gag deposition in the deep structures of the throat, obstructive sleep apnea related to the same, and restrictive lung disease because the bones uh, do not develop normally in Hunter syndrome. So they end up with a relatively small uh, chest volume and a restricted chest wall movement. Uh, and they may also have restrictive airways disease or in re related in part to the chronic inflammation. And then within the mouth, the tongue is normal at birth but enlarges. So you end up with a disproportion between the oral cavity and the tongue affecting a variety of developmental issues, including speech. Enlarged tonsils and adenoids. Tracheomalacia, which actually starts before birth. Uh, the rings of the trachea, which are essentially made of cartilage, are largely made of gags. And so the gag, the metabolic gag, gag abnormality actually leads to dysmorphic uh, malformed tra uh, tracheal rings that can lead to tracheomalacia and collapse in early life. And then the complications uh, of the airway and infection aggravate that problem. And then finally, um, because gags are also involved in the development of uh, structures of the teeth, the children have irregular peg-shaped teeth. They'll go on later in life to have developmental delays or speech delays um, with uh, true mental retardation occurring in about two-thirds of the cases, depending in part on their genetic mutation and in part on, uh, we believe, complications of their disease. Uh, they almost all have microcep macrocephaly with a head circumference at birth, typically at or above the 95th percentile that does not regress uh, again. Uh, coarse facial features as I've mentioned, and rather thick coarse hair and eyebrows. This next slide illustrates some of these features. So looking at this boy in the top left here, you can see that he's also got wide spacing between his teeth. Um, again, there are other potential explanations for that, many of them genetic. Uh, and it's hard to appreciate his hair here because it's cut short. Uh, but I don't think most people would pick his face out of a crowd. Uh, again, with the eye of, of somebody who's seen a lot of these children, one can begin to see features like the broadening of the nose here, the thickening of the lips, and the high prominent forehead that are suggestive of an MPS condition. And those, of course, would become more uh, obvious as the patient ages. Uh, in the next panel at the top here, you can see uh, thick lips. Why thick lips? Again, glycosamine and glycan gag deposition in the connective tissue structures. In the lower panel here on the left and in the middle panel, you can see uh, what are referred to as claw-like hands or carpal tunnel syndrome and are, in fact, both. Uh, this is a process that usually develops after a couple of years of life, although I've seen a couple of babies who were born with hands like this and who actually were diagnosed as having an arthrogryposis, a term usually referred for a neuromuscular clawing of the hands at birth. Uh, who turned out to have MPS2. And then as the patient is older, as in the middle, you have these thick so-called sausage-like uh, digits in a, in a clustered formation. And then you can see uh, stiffening of the joints, which in this and many other metabolic storage conditions occurs peripherally and moves centrally. You can see uh, on the right here that the boy has a short neck and a short trunk. And he's got an angulation in the standing, resting standing posture of his knees due to early joint contractures and his elbows as well.